From time to time when researching the Legends and Tales series, I come across videos that don't have quite enough substance to make up a full video on their own. The three stories in today's video all fall into that category. Join me in this episode of Legends and Tales as we discuss Lives Cut Short. So Hugh Alexander was born on September 21st, 1889. His parents were Frank and Holda Alexander. Sadly, when Hugh was six years old, his father Frank would pass away from what appeared to be blood poisoning. His mother would remarry a man named James Quinn and they would move to a small suburb of Pittsburgh named Etna, Pennsylvania. As Hugh got older, he would start working as a messenger clerk for the Atlantic Refining Company. Now his employer and his co-workers would all say that he was a reliable young man and that he was, he was great to be around. Now after saving up a little bit of money, Hugh would go out and he would buy himself an automatic revolver and a small barge that was listed for sale in need of repair. Now that small barge would be spotted floating down the Ohio River on the evening of April 1st, 1909 by two men who were just kind of hanging out minding their own business. When they saw the barge, they decided to jump in a little rowboat they had and row out and check the barge out and see if maybe it was just a, a boat that somebody had lost track of, maybe it was something they could, they could keep for themselves. Upon climbing into the boat though, the men would discover a gruesome scene. A young man was laying on his back on the bottom of the barge with a gun in his hand and a bullet wound in his right temple. That young man would turn out to be Hugh Alexander. Now immediately most people assumed that this was probably a case of suicide where Hugh had gone out and he had ended his life on his boat. However, his mother would argue adamantly against this. She knew her son well and she knew that he didn't have any kind of issues. He wasn't upset, he wasn't, there's nothing for him to be down about. He had plans for the summer. Everything seemed to be going really well for him. So one thing that his mother would point out is that the automatic revolver was not one that was familiar to Hugh. And her guess was that he was probably messing around with it and he had tripped on the boat somehow and accidentally fired the gun when it was in the wrong position. Now backing this up was local resident A.G. Bone. He reported that evening that he had seen the boy floating down the river on the barge and firing his gun in different areas and just kind of messing around with it. Now Hugh's mother also reported that he had drawn out $50, which would be about $1,500 in today's money, from his bank account before going out on the barge. It's not clear what exactly his plans were with this money, but the fact that he had the money on him meant that he probably had it for, he put, he had it for a reason. He was planning on doing something. Now when his body was found, there was only 35 cents in his pocket, meaning that there, there was a chance that this could have been a robbery gone wrong. Now my guess would be, if it wasn't a robbery gone wrong, most likely the $50 was probably taken out of his pocket by the men who found him, although nobody really knows what happened to it and we have no way of, of substantiating where that money went to. Now regardless of what the public or Hugh's mom thought, the official cause of death was listed on the death certificate as suicide by shooting. I think most likely what happened was he was out on the boat, he'd gotten off work and he was excited to go out shooting. He went and got some, some ammunition to go out shooting with. There was an almost empty box of ammunition that was found on the boat with him. So it's pretty clear that he was out there, he was definitely out there firing his gun. Now, whether or not his intention was to harm himself, that's impossible to know. But based on the one witness that reported seeing him, it does sound like he was out there just kind of horsing around. My guess is he probably slipped and fell on the boat and landed on the ground and accidentally shot himself. Now another possible explanation for, the, for an accidental death would be if he was just laying there kind of relaxing as he was going down the river and maybe he thought that the, the 
weapon was out of ammunition or maybe he didn't realize that it was in the, in the loaded position and he pulled the trigger while it was up near his head and that would have been another explanation for an accidental kind of death. So there's multiple different ways that that could have happened. But one thing that is certain is that on that cool day in April in 1909, a young man's life was ended much too soon. Our next story brings us to the Otterbein United Methodist Church near Rushville, Ohio. Just over here you'll see a headstone that looks like it's sitting in a cage. This is the grave of Mary Engel. Now the reason for this legend lies on the back of this headstone. There's a mark in the shape of a horseshoe and nobody knows exactly when this mark appeared, but what they do know is the story behind the mark. So in 1844 in a small town known as Tattletale, Ohio, there lived two beautiful young girls by the name of Mary Engel and Rachel Hodge. Now legend has it that these girls were so beautiful that men from miles around wanted to be with them, but both of them had eyes for the same man, James Henry. The problem for James was that he couldn't decide which woman he wanted to be with. And according to the legend, when he was on his way back from a business trip one night, he fell asleep at the reins of his horse while riding on his wagon. Now this wasn't a problem because James's horse knew the way home. But on this particular occasion, the horse actually pulled James to the house of Mary Angle. When the horse came to a stop, James would wake with a start thinking that he was home and he would look up to see Mary's house right in front of him. Taking this as a sign, he would go up to the door and knock. And when Mary would come to the door, he would explain to her what had happened and tell her that he took it as a sign that him and her should be married. She excitedly accepted and not long after they were married on January 11th, 1844. By all accounts, their marriage was a very happy marriage. Over the course of the summer, they would spend a lot of time walking hand in hand and they would do one of Mary's favorite activities, which was horseback riding. Mary loved horseback riding so much that James had actually given her one of his horses when they had gotten married as a wedding gift. And this was her favorite horse. Now the marriage was actually going so well that Mary would actually wind up pregnant. And on February 8th of 1845, she would wind up giving birth. Unfortunately, the child was stillborn. 20 days after that, on February 28th, 1845, Mary would actually pass away due to complications from the birth. Now James was devastated. Not only had he lost what would have been his firstborn son, but he also lost the love of his life. Following her death, he would spend many days and nights coming up right over here to visit Mary at her grave. It was on one of these trips sometime in the next couple of years where he would run into Rachel Hodge. Now Rachel and Mary had been close, and Rachel had most likely come to visit Mary at her grave at some point as well, but hadn't run into James until this particular day. They would meet up as Rachel was walking away and James was coming up, and they would start up a conversation. Now the conversation that James and Rachel would have would last for a couple of hours, and by the end of it, they would wind up walking away hand in hand. Not long after, James and Rachel would begin courting, and they would wind up getting married on December 7th, 1848. Now again, according to the legend, James and Rachel would come out here and they would stand next to Mary's headstone as a way to remember her as they began their new life. But shortly after they got married is when locals would report some strange things happening at the cemetery. So this is where our story takes a little bit of a supernatural turn. Supposedly, residents would begin to notice strange lights and hear strange noises coming from the cemetery and particularly around Mary's grave. And this is where the legend kind of differs a little bit from reality. According to the legend, within a week of James and Rachel getting married, a stain in the shape of a horseshoe would appear on the back of the headstone. The day after that, Rachel would find James in the barn laying on the ground dead with the shape of a horse's hoof etched in his face. Now, this is completely inaccurate because James and Rachel would actually be married for the next 11 years or so. They would have four children, all daughters. The first daughter they would name after Mary in celebration of her life. Now, James would pass away on April 8th, 1859. And from everything that I, I looked into and all the historical records that I could find, I could not find a cause of death for him. So it's up in the air what actually killed him. But even if it had been a horse, that doesn't necessarily mean that Mary was getting revenge from beyond the grave. It sounds almost like Mary would have been happy for James that he had found love again, and specifically in the arms of one of her friends that, they, that she had known for years. So our final story brings us here to Section X of the Greenlawn Cemetery to the grave of George A. Blount 
otherwise known as Georgie. Now Georgie was born on September 26, 1867 to Eli and Sarah Blount. Now Eli Blount was the proprietor of the American Hotel in downtown Columbus, and Georgie was a source of joy to staff and guests of the hotel alike. They would routinely see him running throughout the hotel, running down the hallways, running up and down the stairs. Everybody absolutely loved him. Now Georgie also loved to ride down the banisters that lined the stairwells of the hotel. And everybody knew this. Well in 1872, Georgie would have an accident falling off of one of those banisters, but he wasn't seriously injured. However, following this accident, everybody paid a little bit closer attention and, and tried to keep Georgie off the banisters for his own safety. Now on February 7th of 1873, Eli had ordered a carriage for his wife and son so they could go ride about the town and enjoy the day. So after the carriage was ordered, Sarah and Georgie would head from the office, which was downstairs, to the apartment that they stayed in in the hotel upstairs. As they got close to the door, Georgie realized that he'd forgotten something in his father's office, and he would turn around to start heading back down there. Sarah would go ahead and open up the door to the apartment and head inside as Georgie raced back down to get whatever he'd left behind in the office. But Georgie was in a hurry, and he figured the fastest way down to the office would be to jump on the banister and ride down one more time. It was about this time that an office clerk, Mr. Cashett, heard a sound from out in the hallway, and he went rushing out to see what it was. He would find Georgie laying on the floor with the gash on his head and he was unconscious. As he yelled for help, Eli Blunt would come running in the room, finding his son laying on the floor. He would pick his son up and carry him up the stairs and lay him in, and lay him in bed and call for the doctor. Now three separate doctors would attend Georgie over the next week, but there was nothing any of them could do other than try to make him comfortable. Now the week of February 7th to February 14th, Georgie would fade in and out of consciousness before ultimately passing away on February 14th, 1873. Now Georgie would be buried here in Greenlawn Cemetery and his father would erect the statue in memory of him. Over the years since the statue went up, people have come out and they've left little trinkets for Georgie. And for several years, there was actually somebody that was coming out here, a mysterious benefactor, nobody knows exactly who it was, that was dressing Georgie up during the winter time, putting on a hat and a coat and a scarf to try and keep Georgie's statue warm. Now the caretaker would come out and remove the items because if they left on there they would wind up getting moldy and, and it just it would ruin the statue. And the toys from time to time would have to be collected by the cemetery. Ultimately what they decided to do, and what you can now do today, they have a box that sits in the main office of the cemetery where you can drop toys for Georgie and those toys or coats or whatever you happen to bring out will actually be donated to the local children to local children in Columbus who actually need those items. So that's going to do it for this episode of Legends and Tales. I'm curious to get your guys' thoughts. This is the first time that I've done a video like this where it's multiple stories all combined into one video. And I, I kind of like doing this with, as a way to share smaller stories or shorter stories just because not every story works for a full video on its own in the format that I'm doing these videos in now. So I want to know what you guys think. Give me your feedback in the comments down below and let me know, do you like this kind of video? Do you want to see more in the future? I've got some others planned that I potentially may do, especially around Halloween time when we start to get into kind of spooky season. So let me know your thoughts on that. If you're interested in getting some merch or joining the Patreon, both of those will be linked down in the description below. So head over there and check those out. The names of the patrons will be here at the end of the video, alongside some bloopers, I think, because <laughs> I've been trying to add some bloopers in and add some things in to have some fun at the end of some of these videos. It's not going to be every single video. There will be some videos, I think, that are going to be more serious than others. And for those kind of videos, bloopers don't really fit well. But for videos like this or the Cryptid series where I'm trying to have a little bit more fun, I'll add some, some bloopers in at the end just to enjoy and uh, give everybody some, a laugh or two. So, I want to thank you all for watching. That's all I got for this one. Everybody have a great rest of your day, and I will see you in the next Legends and Tales video. I don't want to adjust that just a bit. There we go. Yeah. See how that turns out. Hopefully it's uh, watchable. Getting attacked by wildlife. Now backing this up was local resident <coughs> Now backing this up was local resident Resident Jesus, come on. Now backing this up was local resident A.G. Bone.
So our next story brings us to United Methodist. Brings us to the United Methodist Audubon. So our next story brings us to the United Methodist. Why can't I fucking remember to say Audubon? And not long after, they were married on January 11th, 1844. I need a drink. Over the course of the following summer, they would spend time walking hand in hand throughout the fields. Really? Their marriage was going so well that Mary would actually wind up pregnant over the summer, and by the winter of 20, by the winter of 2022, <laughs> now, Georgia was born on September 16th, September 26th, <laughs> and staff and guests alike. Now, Georgie also loved to go down the banisters that line the railways of the hotel. That line the stairways. Railways? After the carriage was ordered, Sarah and Georgie would head upstairs to their, to their live-in apartment. And for several years, there was actually somebody that was coming out here, a mysterious benefactor, nobody knows exactly who it was, that was dressing Georgie up during the wintertime, putting on a hat and gloves, 